tonight is just a quick look at uh, Bloodhound. Bloodhound is just starting to surface in the media now. It's been running as a program for about seven years. It is the latest British attempt to take the land speed record, which, uh, strangely enough, the same team has held for about 17 years now. So all of this just start off again with, uh, this is just a two minute video, just to set the scene. The, um, the little pots of jet fuel that you've been given, just as a safety note, that, that is actually jet fuel. Um, what we'll do is open them uh, in about 15 minutes' time just to give a hint of an atmosphere, but it's um, real jet fuel, so it's important to keep it off clothes, children, uh, lino, things like that. So um, if the adults can hold on to it for now, that would be great. In July of 1969, like millions of families, we gathered around a television to watch Neil Armstrong take that one small step. The picture was black and white and grainy, but the achievement was clear. In 70 years, in one human lifespan, mankind had gone from the Wright brothers, the first powered flight ever, to the surface of the moon. And yet today, 46 years further on, mankind, people, have gone no further. And it's not just that sense of destiny that we've lost, in the UK at the moment, the skills gap is so wide that engineering graduates are being outnumbered, they say, three to one by hairdressers. So unless we've got some clever way to use human hair instead of carbon fiber, then who's to? We have a problem. In terms of the future, if we're serious about the environment, for example, then everything that we touch, use, drive, plug in, Manufacture, process in any way, needs to be redesigned to be green. But if society is producing no young engineers like last summer's rocket class here, then who's going to do that? So fast cars will come on to in a minute. But next summer in the desert, and here tonight, the purpose of Bloodhound is to inspire a new Apollo generation. A generation which will step up and master technology and control it not just rely on it. And that's why we're doing a 1,000 mile an hour car. The land speed record as it stands is 763 miles an hour. 780 would do, but we're going for 1,000 miles an hour because it's difficult. Because it's not just pushing old data and old ideas around. Because out there in the world, a lot of things look impossible but sometimes that's exactly what we need to shoot for. The journey to 1,000 miles an hour starts with some rules of venue and a bit of history. The rules come from the FIA in Paris, and they're surprisingly simple. <coughs> the car must have four wheels, because it's a car after all. It must be under the control of a driver, not an autopilot or a computer. 
It must run on a one-mile course with a flying start, and that simply means that the car enters the formal course at full speed. And the same car must do a return run on the same course within one hour, and the record speed is the average of the two runs. To get to 1,000 miles an hour, we need about five miles or so to accelerate. And we need about the same again to break afterwards. The places on Earth where we can actually do this are rare and exotic. This is ours having to swim. The actual surface that we need is a salt or alkali lake bed, which needs to flood reliably every year and then dry off to reset our track. The actual venue we're going to is called Hackskin Pan in South Africa. This gives us our 12 mile track, which is great. But the car tears up the ground that it runs on with the shockwaves underneath. So we need 50 or more parallel lanes side by side, the width of about two miles. And this space needs to be cleared by hand of anything larger than half a P. Because graders, runway sweepers, would crack through the crust of the lake and spoil the track. Now, orange jumpsuits like this have not had the best press lately, it's fair to say. But these come with much better news. These represent years' worth of work in an area of 98% unemployment. In this area of Africa, if you're not a pump attendant, you don't have a job. And to give the, put the local support into some kind of context, Ludham left its first meeting with the South African government, not just with handshakes and smiles, but with a ministerial directive of support for the programme. In terms of history, it helps that quite a few of the team have substantial land speed racing history. But there's one or two insights in there for the design of the car, which are actually quite crucial. The thrust SSC here on its supersonic run actually had its back wheels off the ground. And they're the ones that steered. The beauty of this photograph is that you can basically see the white line across the sound barrier actually breaking. But that plume of dust behind the car is two or three centimetres of topsoil being torn up by the shockwave system under the car. This means that the flow underneath and behind the car isn't air anymore. It's a pulverised rock mixture and it's worth almost as much drag as the car's air brakes. The design of the car itself kicks off properly with aerodynamics and here there are two fundamentals. One is drag or air resistance and this varies not with the speed of the car but with the speed of the car squared. So going twice as fast is four times as hard. And the second fundamental is stability. Like a shuttlecock here, the car is going to travel heavy end first. The design challenge is to keep the centre of gravity as that moves around with fuel burn and so forth, in front of the aerodynamic centre of the car, which is quite simply the centre of the car that the air sees. Air is all around us, we walk through it, we breathe it, how hard can it be? But in some ways, the aero challenge is tremendous. For example, the behavior of the air varies fundamentally with the speed of the car. Subsonic air is like a classic Jaguar. It's elegant, flowing. The air in front can feel the car coming, and it knows to get out of the way. But above about 600 miles an hour or so, parts of the car are going locally supersonic. And because this happens unevenly up and down the length, the car can pitch. At 750 miles an hour, the car is fully supersonic. The curves of the Jaguar give way to straight edges, fields of pressure, the air being torn open as the car goes along. And at this point, the centre of pressure takes off quite quickly backwards down the car by perhaps a metre or so. And again, this upsets the balance. <coughs> With thrust SSC, it was estimated that half a degree of pitch change on the car was enough to take off. Another aero challenge is air density. This is a Lockheed Starfighter. It's a serial record holder from the 1950s and 60s. At altitude, this plane will do 1,400 miles an hour. Bring it down to sea level, and it will only do 988. And the reason for this is that the air down here is much, much denser than aircraft are used to. And this puts a particular burden of load onto the exterior of the car. For example, at full speed, 
Blood Hound is pushing something like 20 tons of air in front of it. That's about the same weight as this JCB. When we understand figures like that, we can estimate the drag, we can know the drag of the car. Then we know how much power we need. Then we can go shopping for engines. <laughs> Wheel driven cars, piston engines, don't have anything like the speed. Hybrids have nothing like the power. So for us, it's a straight choice between jets and rockets. Jet engines like this are good because they can be throttled. They can be run at any power setting. The driver, as in a normal car, has an accelerator. Uh, although with slightly slower responses, strangely enough, for such a fast uh, vehicle, the uh, ability to rev a jet engine is much, much slower than a piston engine. And with a jet, you can burn jet fuel straight into the exhaust, as here, for a second stage of combustion called reheat or afterburner. This doubles the drama and adds about 50% to the power. But there's a problem. You might think that a jet engine just sucks in air at the front. But in fact, a jet prefers to run steadily, rather below the speed of sound. Much faster than this, and the air starts to pile up in front of the engine waiting to get in, and so does the drag. Thrust SSC here have two simple round pitot air intakes at the front of the car. And in fact, these are what limited the top speed. To go meaningfully faster, we couldn't evolve this design. We're looking for 30% more speed. And to do that, one or more of those intakes had to go. <coughs> the second power choice for us is rockets. These are smaller, lighter, simpler than jets of the same power. They don't need an air intake. And if you package them correctly behind the driver in a car, you can achieve a power installation that adds no drag to the vehicle. But again, there's an issue. Because a rocket, unlike a jet, can't be throttled. It's either on or it's off. And a rocket that's powerful enough to get to 1,000 miles an hour in one go kicks off so violently that it can easily kill or disable the driver. Now jets burn fuel in air, rockets burn fuel and oxidant. And the combination of these two elements gives rise to three different types of rocket for us to play with. The big rockets here on the side of the space shuttle are solid rockets. Here, all the propellant is molded together into a solid cake inside the tube. It's safe enough to handle, but when it's lit, we can't put it out. So if the car has an accident early in its run, it might be coming down the desert on its side, and it could be there for 20 seconds at full power before it even starts to slow down. Most space rockets, as we would know, are liquid rockets. And here, both elements are stored as liquid on board. For a car, we can shut off valves and turn off the engine if we need to. However, both liquids are highly hazardous. Both are normally cryogenic, which means they need massive insulation to keep them well below zero. And they explode on the slightest contact with each other. For example, a slight spill at refueling. So it's not a safe option. The third option, which we've gone for, and this is our rocket under test, is a hybrid. And here the fuel is solid. In fact, it's basically aircraft tire rubber, the same chemical. The oxidant is liquid. And this means that if, for example, the car lifts a wheel, we can instantly turn off the rocket motor. The oxidant is hydrogen peroxide, but it's much better known around the world. It's blonde hair dye. <laughs> Hybrid rockets have two problems for us, uh, but neither are showstoppers. One is that with the fuel molded into the rocket tube, changing the rocket tube at turnaround, refueling the car between runs, is like handling a full-size charcoal barbecue while it's still cooking. Another problem is the sheer appetite for oxidant. Well, the rocket needs a ton of oxygen pumped into it in 20 seconds during a run. And for this, we need a third engine to feed the second. At this point, Jaguar stepped forward with the V8 from one of these. It's a little over 500 horsepower, modern, reliable engine, starts on the button, and it sits pretty much down here in the belly of the bloodhound. So it was an early design choice for us, but for our power, we have 
eject to control acceleration. Hybrid rockets for about 60% of the power, and a V8 car engine for hair dye. <laughs> These are enough to get the car up to its peak speed of 1,050 miles an hour in the middle of the measure mile, so we have to get an average of 1,000 over two runs. The problem now is stopping the car before it gets to this sign. <laughs> That's actually the tricky bit. Like in the acceleration phase, we have three different systems to stop the car, and each is triggered independently by the driver because there are no autopilots and so forth. However, in the acceleration phase, the car can fail and coast to a standstill down the desert. Now we're halfway down the desert. We're at full speed. And we're rushing at the rocks and the stones that are firing in the desert that can shatter the wheels, tear the belly out of the car. At 1,000 miles an hour, even turning the power off is worth about a 3G shunt of deceleration. Below this, at about 800 miles an hour, air brakes start to open. These deploy fully below the speed of sound. Below this, we have parachutes. But we're hoping on record runs, certainly on the outboard leg of record runs, not to use these. A parachute, when it's been deployed, is one more thing to pack up and organize, put back in the car, and we've only got an hour's turnaround to do it. And if for any reason either of those main engines is still burning, then the whole lot can go up in flames. But if push comes to the shelf, if safety is at stake, we carry two on the car and we can live to fight another day. Below this, we have wheel brakes, just like a normal car. You might think that an F-16 is a decent place to go for high-performance wheel brakes. But after testing, the discs looked something like this. And at this point, the discs haven't been troubled to stop the car at all. They've just exploded from being spun at 8,500 RPM. <coughs> Heavier brakes from the Eurofighter lasted another 1,000 RPM. We need more than 10,000 with a safety margin. This film, in spite of the flames at the top, is actually a success. This is a test of steel, traditional steel brake discs, heavier but more reliable. I don't know if anyone would care to hazard a guess what sort of speed we're braking the car from with wheel brakes. It's just 200 miles an hour. It's only a fifth of the speed that we need to lose. And when we've finished, we have four incandescent brake packs sitting in wheel arches that are only made of aluminium and carbon fiber. Amongst the aluminium in the wheel arches is, uh, are the wheels themselves. Tires come off at about 400 miles an hour or so. So these are solid metal, and they're some of the hardest working parts of the car. Those wheel rims at full speed are subject to something like 50,000 G of acceleration. To put that into perspective, if I could somehow attach this one kilo bag of sugar to the wheel rim and run it at full speed, it would weigh six tons more than one of those. <clears throat> but um, one of the surprises for us was in desert testing, running the wheels on the sand, the constant sand blasting process actually repairs quite substantial damage to the wheels, so there's a silver lining to that. Elsewhere on the car, the design philosophy is reliability. And this is one reason why we don't have turbo pumps for the rocket instead of a V8. It's why we don't have an injection seat. An injection seat is a very complex system. It's almost as complex as the rest of the car. It multiplies the chances of things going wrong. Thrust SSC, the previous car, was instrumented to investigate this, and we found at least four occasions where they would have thrown a healthy driver out of a healthy car. It may sound a bit rich, but since we've gone for three engines and three different braking systems, but sometimes simplicity as a charm all of its own. <coughs> Long after the echo fades in South Africa, it's a lot more than just desert air that we'll be pushing. This might look all like a bit of an extravagance in a recession, but behind what we're doing is some hard facts. In the next five years, 50% of aeronautical engineers are eligible for retirement. That's half the profession. It's the experience half of the profession. And 10 years after that, the world's airlines expect to double the size of their fleets. Who's going to do that? 
Against this background, the first aim of Bloodhound is to inspire a new generation to engage with science and technology and actually make the future. There's a widely held belief that it takes 10,000 hours to build worthwhile career skills, five full years of practice at the level of surgeon, engineer, concert pianist, that kind of depth of knowledge. We need to show that it's worth it, that that's what it takes, but that with that insight and experience, the things that people can do in the real world are amazing. Second aim of Bloodhound is to rally the industry and its research base. Industry as the actual means to deliver the future needs a can-do attitude, just like people. Breaking the land speed record, surprisingly enough, is only in third place. It just happens to be the language that we speak. And in fourth place, is flying a flag for the sponsors who shared the vision for this 10-year uh, journey. Bloodhound is not a big team. Our total budget is perhaps half a dozen races for a small Formula One team. We can't tell people what careers to have, what jobs to do. That kind of passion in any case has to come from inside. But we can show people what is possible. That people can dare to achieve. That the impossible is just a problem that's still being cracked. I'd like to finish with a quick look at the actual run of the car, what it will look like in the desert coming up. If, first of all, the people with pots can take the lids off now, just give them a gentle wave. For those of you watching at home, this is a hint of jet fuel going into the air, just to give some trackside ambience. And for those of you here tonight, this is, of course, a non-smoking venue. <laughs> um, we have the mic to it. <coughs> What will a run of the car actually look like? In the desert, the heat of the day drives a crosswind that we can't run in. So the car runs at dawn. The team is nocturnal. The spectator city in the distance, a twinkle of lights below the horizon. The sharp desert night air is alive and ready. Jet on. Ground idle to flight idle breaks off. Slowly, very slowly, Bloodhound builds to 100 miles an hour, but then it picks up its heels. Dry thrust to wet. Shock diamonds stretching out into the jet exhaust. Markers start to blur, the fin bites, the car steadies. Jag on, then the surge of the rocket. Sam Barrier shaken to a blur, and his arms nearly three times their normal weight on the steering wheel as the entry marker rips past one second, two, rocket off, out of the measured mile in three and a half seconds. Instantly, 3G forwards in the harness under deceleration. 900 miles an hour, 800, air brakes start to open. Mach transition down, 700 miles an hour, air brakes juddering right out into the air. 600, five, four, turn around team in sight. Up ahead, the car's shockwave hits them. 180 degree turn around pit team, position the car and stop. Tiny chase cars coming in down the desert. Let the rolls spool for a moment to cool down, then signal safe to approach the car. Everyone holding their breath for the timekeeper. The African sun now watching us from the horizon. And we do it all again in one hour.